In recent years, we've been getting some well-received reboots to franchises that thrived and changed the state of gaming by setting the standard in the past. It now seems to have become the norm to remake slash reboot old IPs but take the better sum of their parts that made them iconic and give them a modern touch-up and feel. I remember it being hard to digest a few years ago the idea of reboots, but here we are in 2017 kind of embracing and even expecting them. One that's been piquing everyone's interest, especially my own, is Sega's Sonic Mania. A passion project aiming to bring good old 2D Sonic back to his prime, spearheaded by the Taxman himself. This is a pretty big deal for Sega in terms of Sonic the Hedgehog, as it's been kind of a steep hill for them keeping the mascot relevant in a positive light. And what we got here is a very enticing, nostalgic piece that is probably one of the most vibrant and energetic Sonic games in the past decade. So the last time I touched up on Sonic was when I did a retrospective of Sonic CD, a game I missed out on playing growing up. It ended up becoming one of my favorite of the 2D Sonic games, with such an amazing Japanese OST, sort of a dark edge to its narrative, and strong visuals to complement it, I was in love. I had plenty of fun researching the specific port I played, as the sprites were remastered and the gameplay was at a stable 60 frames with loads of extra content jam-packed in it, which made it the smoothest Sonic game entry and the best way to play the damn thing. And that led me to the man known as the Taxman. Who is the Taxman, you ask? Well, he's actually just a big old lovable Sonic fan. Christian Whitehead, an independent Australian programmer, creator of the Retro Engine, the engine used to recreate old Sonic games from the ground up has been working on Sonic fan games independently for a number of years. He pitched a demo of Sonic CD running on his own engine, Sega took notice, and officially released the port. And it's history from there. And that is such a crazy thing to me. I've heard stories of modders being hired for their work by big game companies, but to bring people who have spent over a decade making 2D fan games to be put in charge of developing an official game for a mascot as famous as Sonic must have been exciting and an extremely nerve-wracking task. But man, was that risk worth it. When booting up Sonic Mania, the game is already hinting at its charm and style for what's ahead. Its attention to detail alone can be seen through its title screen. Sonic Mania does a good job capturing a certain kind of nostalgia. The kind that I haven't really felt since Shovel Knight. And what I mean by this is, both of these games do an excellent job of capturing the good that made old era games fun, while fixing up the mechanics that were held back by their hardware limitations that made going back to earlier Sonic games kind of frustrating. By putting in subtle fixes, it makes the experience smooth and coherent. Our view distance is much bigger in this game which means you're not just going to lose your rings to idle enemies you couldn't even make out. Although it still happens, it happens much, much, much less. With the new Air Dash, gameplay has never felt so connected and flow-heavy. The Air Dash's main function is to keep the player's momentum consistent whenever you jump in the air, and when you're applying it well and zipping through stages, it feels good. I feel as though this will eventually turn into a really useful and practical speedrunning tool. If you want to take a break from the blue blur, you can also choose between playing Tails and Knuckles. The characters kind of represent the game's way of showing you difficulty levels without having you blatantly pick an easy, medium, or hard mode. Tails makes getting through stages more of a breeze as Sonic represents a definitive way of playing the game. Knuckles, on the other hand, has a varied and almost radically different level design to work with his approach of solving levels, as he has the ability to scale walls and glide around. This grants the game some amazing replay value. Little Brother Co-op, as I like to call it, also makes a return, which allows someone to take over Tails and or Knuckles, which isn't too helpful as you're more than likely just lose track of the other character while you're zipping through the map, but hey, it can be very useful in fighting bosses that are giving you a hard time. So much easier that you could just stand in the corner and let your friend do all the work. Bonus stages are of course still a thing, but doing both grants you different awards. You can do the tedious blue spear run from Sonic 3, or what seems to be kind of a rework of Sonic CD's UFO levels. 
Doing the Spear Run will grant you fun tokens to unlock bonus content, while the latter grants you Chaos Emeralds, which in classic Sonic fashion grants you the true ending of the game. This, coupled with some solid level structure of the game's story, really gives the game its punch. The game's plot follows with Sonic and Tails going back to Angel Island, and upon inspection, they see Eggman and our devious new group of antagonists known as the Hard Boiled Heavies. These bad guys are mining for some gemstones that seem to have the ability to warp time, and from there, your adventure begins. The Heavy's design choices gives them that, yeah, we're bad guys, but we're also stylish bad guys, which really helps on making them stand out. There are tons of routes in each level you can take, which can either benefit you or make the whole process a terrible time. You kind of have to be pretty inexperienced or bad to really get stuck on a zone, as each level, for the most part, is fair. We have save slots like Sonic 3 and CD, which lets you leave the game if you're currently busy. Ring collecting is encouraged, as getting a hundred of these bad boys lets you cash out and get an extra life. Lose all of your lives, however, and you'll be forced to start the stage from the first zone, meaning you'll have to fight both bosses of that zone over again. I have mixed feelings about this. In one hand, it provides a more classic feel and makes you approach the levels with caution and helps you learn the obstacles ahead, but on the other hand, it feels like a dated and frustrating punishment that kind of puts off people in a time crunch. Not everyone has the time to afford doing a level over, but this is a Sonic game, so it's kind of expected. The game even has a no-save mode, if you're more of a Sonic 1 and 2 fan, but that feels more like the European extreme runs of Metal Gear Solid, so I'll pass. I am in love with Sonic Mania's boss fights. They're the icing on the cake. After each zone is completed, they provide some really interesting patterns and really test your ability of perfect placement. There's also a mean bean machine boss, which is such a great surprise. Not all of them are fun though. Oil Zone seems to come to mind, but overall they are solid and do a good job of testing your skill. Mania takes a lot of the old, but turns it out as new. We get levels from older entries, but overhauled and improved, while also having some of the most carefully crafted and fun as hell new levels in the mix. Now the 2D Sonic games have always provided stellar spriting and background art, and this game's visuals don't disappoint either. The new stages are filled with some of the most vibrant, hard-hitting sprite art I've seen in a Sonic game. We got these cyberpunk dystopia aesthetics like the Titanic Monarch, or the vibrant sci-fi as Circus Studioopolis, or the amazing spaghetti western Mirage Saloon Zone, which has some really cool callbacks to other Sonic characters. The work behind these stages really make me wish there were more new stages, or even just new stages, because the zones feel alive and attention to detail is everywhere on them, from the mobs to the background palettes. This is especially present in our hero Sonic. Sonic looks cute, he looks cool, his idle animations capture his cocky, lovable attitude, and it really brings him to life. The set pieces are accompanied with an intricate OST that feels like a Sonic CD and Sonic 3 love child. Every track of this OST is catchy, it's unique, and it gives each stage its own tone and character. T. Lopes, the man behind the soundtrack, knew exactly what made Sonic music good. This game has a fully animated opening that I'm sure everyone has seen, but if you haven't, please do so, because that is some stellar art. It's really weird knowing that Tyson animated this while also being behind the comic from way back then. You know, Nipples the Hedgehog? Yeah, that one. In the recent Mega64 podcast, they talked a bit of just how much blood, sweat, and tears were poured in by Tyson when directing and animating this opening. He's been working on it for quite some time. You did a fantastic job capturing the world, the feeling, and just how cool and fun Sonic the Hedgehog really is. This whole game is a fan community effort. There's love filled in every aspect of this entry because this comes from people who haven't stopped loving Sonic. This game is directed by someone who's been making Sonic fan games for over a decade, and he was given a team of fully passionate people slash fans who wanted Sonic to go back to his roots. His real roots. What made the Hedgehog such a gosh darn big deal? It's why Sega slapped on that Sega Proudly Presents tagline when you turn on the game. Because they know it's good. And they know people are going to love it. What everyone behind this game has provided is a truly worthy sequel to Sonic 3 and Knuckles that 4 just could not do. I think this game is also a good example on how game companies can benefit on having competent fans prove that they can indeed create a game worthy of being officially published and distributed something other companies could really use. 
If you like Sonic, you should not miss out on this game. This is a great callback to the series' roots, and just an amazing experience to go through. Truly by the mania, for the mania. Nothing to 